Now, listen, get comfortable. I'm going to use my time, but I promise you it'll be a blessing to you. Y'all ready? This is part number nine in the series called Hijacked. Somebody say overcoming the enemy of distractions. Distractions are your enemy. And I want to do this maybe a little differently than I did in the first service. Uh, I feel like a little bit of a different need. But we started talking about, if you go to Matthew chapter 13, last week we started talking about counterfeits as one of the main distractions. How many of y'all here for that last week? Counterfeits, amen? And if we can put up Matthew 13 for me, Jesus is talking about counterfeits, and they're very, very sneaky. And if you go to verse 24, can I read through this kind of quick? I'm going to glance over this pretty fast. But I want you to see something that's very important. Somebody say counterfeit. All right, so Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. What is Jesus talking about here? The kingdom of heaven sowing or expanding its culture, ideas, its government into the world. He's explaining it, right? But then he said, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares appeared. When did the tares appear? They appeared when it was harvest time. They appeared when the grain had sprouted and produced the crop. That means through that entire process of this, uh, in this case, a farmer sowing a seed, but when the kingdom doing its work in the earth, that in the entire process, the tare and the wheat are identical and undetectable throughout the phases that they go through. That means that if you are handling your life or living your life under a counterfeit idea, which is what the tear represents, because you remember last week we, we talked about the wheat and the tear, they are identical. They're undetectable. And even when you first plant them and they grow together, I mean, these, you're just looking at one here. But if you looked at them amongst each other, they are undetectable through the process of their growth. So you can be living with a counterfeit all the way up to the point where it matures and not even know it. Because everything looks right when you start. That career looked right when you started it. Ten years later, you're like, that marriage looked right when you, I mean, the. he looked good when you, st it looked good, it looked right when it started. Everything looks right when it starts. Something comes up and everybody's like, look how amazing it is. Look how good it is. Look how powerful it is. Some churches, they explode in growth early in their beginning. They all look good when they start. You may, not be, you may not be aware that you are under a spell for years until the crop comes and then the lie appears. Because at the end, there's always a payment due at the end of that harvest. There's always, you're going to always harvest what you have been under and what you've been reaping and what you've been sowing, rather. So you got to understand you can follow, a counterfeit is very, very sneaky because it distracts you without even you knowing you are distracted. You remember we talked about the two systems and all of that. We didn't even know we were distracted. So Jesus is talking about this and then he says, an enemy, verse 28, has done this. And the servant said, do you want us to go and gather them up? And he said, no, because while you gather up the tear, you also might uproot the wheat with them and let them both grow together until the harvest. And then at the end... Of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then they asked Jesus to explain this parable. Verse 36, Jesus sent the multitude away into the house and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, explain the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus said, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. Verse 38, the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the what? They are the offspring of the kingdom. The kingdom is an environment. It is a state or a country, an environment, and you are a son or product of what you have been learning and subjected to. God 
has a kingdom program that is supernatural and above this realm, and it doesn't function like the natural world. But then he says, the, the enemy, verse 39, who sowed them is the devil. Oh, excuse me. Verse, verse 38, let me finish that. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. The wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. So my point of this first part that I want to tell you is that sometimes you got to understand that the counterfeit looks identical to the real thing, but you may not even be aware that it's a counterfeit because they all start the same. And this is why we urge people to understand the kingdom because the way you spot a counterfeit, the best way is to know the original very intimately. It does no good. I keep saying this, and I still think that people... I still think that people sometimes maybe get a little bit offended when I start talking about fakes in the world. And it's because most of you work in one of them fake systems. Yeah, and I understand. You, I understand. But what, what I'm saying to you is these systems are gods to most people. And, they are, and you know it is because if you try to take one away from them, they go through a, a, a real bad reaction. If you try to introduce a new system to someone who is hooked on another system, they start, they resist it. Right? And the kingdom of God, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That means that the laws that govern it don't apply the same way the ones of the earth work. And you could be completely distracted by something that is not of God but be in love with it because it looks good. And a lot of people are living by it. And even though nobody's living a good life by it. Even though it continues to fail, what we do is we just say, let's try again. It fails and we say, let's try again because, you know, we're not quitters. Let's try it again. Let's do it again instead of switching it completely. Jesus said the kingdom is, he compared it to, he said, you cannot sew a new piece of cloth onto an old garment because it will tear, the new cloth will tear the other one and it will be ruined. You have to completely change the fashion altogether. You can't, you can't add the kingdom onto the earth. You can't put the kingdom on a carnal man. You can't anoint a carnal man. You can't, you can't put something supernatural in a carnal or physical box and say work. You can't dispense the kingdom of God through a carnal vehicle. I'm, I'm preaching something really serious right now. Are y'all catching this? It, it doesn't work. So when you study the kingdom, you're studying the only real government that exists. And then what happens is you already have an idea of how things work. And when a new idea is introduced... The carnal man and the fleshly man fight against each other. And there's a, a lot of decisions that you have to make because it puts you under stress. And here's what you got to understand. The kingdom of God always distresses the original, the old systems. When the kingdom is introduced, it always threatens what you were holding on to. I know we're saying, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And y'all don't understand that Jesus loves you so much, he wants to destroy the world you've been living in. I mean destroy it. I mean we ain't keeping nothing. We're going to refashion the whole thing. We're not building on top of error. Yes, Jesus loves me. He loves me so much. He just loves me. He just loves on me the way. No, no. Jesus brings a wrecking ball to your mind. I mean, he brings dynamite to your mind and puts it under anything that doesn't look like what he looks like and what he planted. And he blows it up. And the problem with that is you're attached to that thing. Oh, boy. So Paul is talking about fakes. Let me go to 2 Corinthians 11. So you, got, you understand why studying the kingdom is Jesus' method of transformation, right? But when he comes in, you got to understand, 
he's threatening every system that exists. So he can't use their systems because he's threatening them. They're all counterfeits, okay? They're all counterfeits. And as the kingdom continues to try to advance in your life, as I talked about before, your earthly consciousness has to go down while your kingdom consciousness goes up. Your earthly education, people are trying to increase it. You should be trying to decrease it. Lord, I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. Try to understand where we are as a society, as a world. We, we put earthly education in all of its forms, not just the school type of education, but all of man's cultural, carnal, philo- philosophical, you know, any type of informational intake physically, okay? We are increasing that because now we have machines of distraction called the internet, cell phones, and we have more contact with error people and things than ever. So we are increasing in the knowledge of the error. And we are still not preaching the kingdom. So our kingdom information, our understanding of how to function in that reality is not increasing. And what we're actually trying to do as believers is we're trying to simultaneously increase both of them at the same time. Say, Lord, use my earthly understanding with your kingdom understanding. And if this one doesn't work, I'll let you be the backup. But you don't understand. Increasing the kingdom in a society decreases the other rulers. I'm trying it. So, so we have to increase our understandings of that. That means you should become more naturally supernatural day by day. You should be less afraid of the failures of the systems that you are looking at every single day because you are increasing. You know what the love of God and the grace of God does? It gives you the kingdom. That's what it's for. And so if you're getting this new system and God's willing to give it to you, you have to drop the other one. We say an amen now. Here, I'm about to come though. All right, 2 Corinthians 11. Lord, have mercy. I got time. I got time. I'm going to take my time. This is too important. Now, watch Paul. Paul is talking to a church, talking about counterfeits. Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Look at the connection here. Your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I got to do some work here. This is totally different from the first service. Y'all ready for this? All right, class, let's get to work here. Um, I'm going to... Change this. I think this shows up better. All right. Y'all didn't give me no slides. My media team making me up here do some extra work. I need slides. You know how I am. Okay. So for this one, so you see he says, unless the serpent deceived, uh, like the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity That is in Christ. All right, let's start with this. The word simplicity there. What is going on with this thing? I'll just leave it white, man. What? Somebody come deal with this. Let me just talk about it, amen? I'll let them work on this. I'll just talk about it. Write this in your notes, amen? The simplicity that that is in Christ. Write the word simplicity in your notes and write clear. Clear. Deceived and corrupted from the clear understanding of Christ. Then I want you to write down beside clear singleness or whole. In other words, trying to get you off of a counterfeit system into the only government that exists, which is in Christ. The singleness. I don't like that translation, the simplicity, because that makes it seem simple. It doesn't mean simple, like, oh, that's easy. 
It's not, that's not what that is. It means clear and single, meaning nothing else. The singleness, the authority, the sovereignty that is in Christ. You write that down? And then I want you to write, y'all let me know when I can do something over there. I'm good? Okay, so you wrote that down? Now write the word Christ. And I want you to write, I'm going to show you what this is. All right, so for, for the class today, Christ is not, this is how we're preventing counterfeits, because I'm going to show you the real deal, okay? Say amen. amen. Christ, write this down, it means anointing. It is not Jesus' last name, which is what I used to think. Anointing. I'm going to teach you a little bit right here. Anointing. So the simplicity and which gives it the simplicity or the clearness of it and the, and the pureness of it, which is what constitutes its power and authority. If you mix it with a counterfeit, it nullifies it. You cannot coexist with these two entities. They fight against each other. You're going to follow one and not the other or follow this one and not that one. He said, I don't want you like, like uh, Eve was deceived with the craftiness of the enemy. What did the enemy do? He only presented another option. He said, what about the tree of the knowledge of good? There is no evil. Evil is not a thing. So he gave them two trees and the two programs. So now in our world, we accept the fact that maybe there's a good thing. And a bad thing. Maybe there's some yin and some yang. Maybe there's some light and some darkness. I'm here to tell you there's no yang. And darkness is the absence of a thing. It's not a thing. Evil is not a thing. It's the absence of a thing. Evil is not an entity that can jump on you. Evil is only something that is a figment of your imagination and an illusion given by the father of lies that if you believe it, then you give power to it and it's not even real. So he doesn't want you to be deceived that there are two systems. Because remember, what is distraction? Trying to believe two systems at the same time. Maybe I can do it a carnal way. Maybe I can do it a kingdom way. Maybe this actually exists and we need to deal with it in the physical sense. Or maybe I can deal with it in the spiritual sense. And Christian folks try to do both. The first thing we try is Tylenol. Nothing against Tylenol. But, you know... As I was talking about before, listen, so is Tylenol a physical thing? Yes, it is. Are you a spiritual thing? Yes, you are. Are spiritual things perfect? Are they perfect? God is spirit. You are his child. Or is it, are you perfect? You are perfect. Jesus said, be perfect even as your father in heaven. He is perfect. Be that. He didn't say you're going to be that. He said, be perfect as your father. When you be something, you be it in your head. When you pretend something, you do it in your body, but you don't be it in your head. Be perfect. Know you're perfect. Okay. Then he said, now, so if the Tylenol is material, but you are spiritual, there's no law in the universe where a physical thing can change anything about a spiritual thing. Earth changes, heaven, none at all. Nothing that happens in the physical realm ever changes anything in the kingdom. They can pass any laws in Congress. They don't change kingdom laws. They can do anything they want in the natural. It does not change the purity and the perfection in the kingdom. There's nothing they can do to block heaven's supply or stop heaven's supply. All they can do is get you distracted from it. All they can do is hide it from you. It is still yours. It is still there. It is still powerful. It is still abundant. It is still perfect. But are you distracted from it? Do you understand it? Watch this now. I'm way off my notes, but hallelujah. So your minds may be corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ. What did I say Christ meant? Anointed. So we know that this idea of Christ is the anointing. Now, get your thinking cap on here. Anointing. Somebody say anointing. Anointing is not, you know, shaking and smoke coming from the air conditioner or anything like that, okay? The anointing, this is powerful, the anointing has three ingredients, okay? I'll tell you a simple definition, then I'll try to break it down a little bit. The anointing is... 
the presence of the government of heaven actively ruling something. It is the supernatural, super consciousness of the government of God being applied or residing in another location. In other words, it is, it is put on something or it resides. Now it's in you. Now, if you're going to know the difference in the fake systems of the world and the kingdom of God, you have to start to study the reality of Christ or you'll be deceived. Let me finish what Paul said, then I'm going to show you what anointing is. It has three ingredients, okay? I'm not talking about physical ingredients. It's got three spiritual things that you need to know about it. Let me keep reading my verse right here. For What, what verse are we on? For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which... You have not received, he's saying, from himself, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, meaning the one he gave you before, the gospel. Which, is the, which gospel is the gospel? What did Jesus say the gospel is? What gospel did Jesus preach? He didn't preach any other gospel. Okay, so now we know what the gospel is. It is the gospel of the kingdom. That is according to the king's mouth. No other, you don't get your gospel from any of the commentaries in the Bible or other books. The gospel from Jesus' mouth is his gospel of the kingdom. That's from his mouth. Okay? And so, for if he preaches another Jesus or another gospel um, that you haven't accepted, you may well put up. Go to the next verse. You may well put up with it. In other words, if you don't know the truth, you'll be putting up with something that is a counterfeit. And obviously, Paul is dealing with people that are taking things that are familiar to believers... Like the name of Jesus and making it a completely different subject so that you don't even know what is the true gospel or not just because churches are saying Jesus. And they're picking up this book and they're saying this is the gospel. Paul said, don't you believe anything that I didn't already introduce to you because I gave you the gospel. Just because you hear the word Jesus in a church or from one of your friends doesn't mean that they know the real one. Just because they say we are here to preach the gospel today. Universally, that is not the same. I was talking to a person. I'm going to keep this very top secret. I'm not going to reveal anything. But I was speaking to a person yesterday. And we were talking about church. They were asking me some questions. And then they were talking about some stuff that they do. In their business, they run. And they said, you don't like that kind of, essentially, you don't like that kind of stuff, do you? I said, no, we don't. I said it nicely. I said, but no, no, we, we don't, we don't. And uh, you, you would prefer that not exist, wouldn't you? I said, yes, I would prefer that not exist. And they were shocked. And their next phrase was, but you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian too. I mean, and I said, I don't think you've been taught the right gospel. Because it's obvious to me that world's idea of what Christian is, is putting up with a bunch of counterfeits. And then they themselves are now behaving behind these counterfeits and things that, yes, I do wish it would go away. And I'm actively trying to make it go away. And they're shocked. Are you trying to make that stuff go away? We love that stuff. And I say, yes, I'm trying to make it go away. And no point in faking. I'm trying to make it go away. Yes, I'm trying to close these places. Yes, I'm trying to get rid of that. Yes. You should be too. You're like, but Pastor Mike, we love this stuff. No, because God wants to close it. God wants it to go away. God wants everybody to be believing and operating. Why would we accept such a low counterfeit when we got the kingdom? Why would we live in a life like that when we could have the better life? Why would we put up with that? Anywho. Verse, verse 12, are y'all still here? Okay, but verse 12, now Paul, so we know what he's talking about, counterfeits and fakes to what he gave them. But what I do, he said, I will also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things that which, in which they boast. Because those people, verse 13, are for, for such are false apostles. They are false apostles, deceitful workers, and what do they do? They actually make themselves into apostles of Christ. 
Now, now, if you know the ingredients in, so a Christ means anointed. If you know what's in the anointing, then you know which one is fake. Right? You know which one is fake. You know which one not to believe. And, and you know which one is the truth. So he says, uh, maybe you didn't know this, verse 14, no wonder, but Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And what did we talk about when we discussed counterfeits? You won't know that it's not God until the harvest is already about to come. You could be following something Satan gave you that's a complete fake and not even know it and won't even know it till it's almost too late. So Paul is trying to tell them what the real. So he said, if you're going to follow the real Jesus, it's got to be the one he told them about. If you're going to hear the real gospel, it's got to be the one we told you about, which is the one Jesus talked about. Not just putting the word Jesus on everything, but talking about what Jesus himself discussed. What did he discuss? Everywhere he went, he discussed his father's kingdom, right? Therefore, it is no great thing that his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Y'all, so we see, we see churches and, and ministries and people, not just churches, but also in the world, distracted people who don't understand a lick about the kingdom of God. We can't spot it. We don't know how to deal with it. We don't know how to get rid of it. We don't know what to do with these fakes. And listen, the Bible teaches you to test the spirits. Now, if you don't know how to test a spirit, then you're going to be caught up in counterfeits all the time and not even knowing it. Did you know that, that, that when I showed you this picture of the wheat and the tear, it's gone now. But it had, they're identical. Did you know one grain of that tear can kill a man? It make you sick or kill you. All right, so somebody say anointing. All right, the word anointing in Hebrew, I'm going to go back to the Hebrew, okay? Let's see if I have enough room. It's Masah. And it is the root word where we get the term Messiah. Somebody say Messiah. This is the root of the anointing. So when you see Christ, this is literally the word. It means in Greek, Messiah. But in the Hebrew, this is the root word, Messiah. It's three letters. It's not one, two, three, four. It's not five letters. That's English. And the Hebrew, let me, I'm going to go to the next screen to give me some room here. In Hebrew, it is, and this reads right to left, not left to right. It's mem, shin. Somebody say, hey. It's mem, shin, hey. Somebody say that. Mem, shin, hey. Mashiach. This is Mashiach. This is the Messiah. This is the this is, now in Hebrew, you study every letter individually. Every letter that makes up a word, the letter is a word in itself. So every letter is a word. It's not like our alphabet, but every letter is a word. So and for us, the M, it is a word. Mem is a word. The letter itself is made up of other words. So the mem is also made up of other words because it is a word. So if you use the letter to spell something, it also has words that make up the words. So when you spell mem, M-E-M in English, like in Hebrew, every stroke and everything is a different letter built together like, a, like a, you're building a building. Every stroke, every, every letter in the Hebrew starts with a yud, which is just a dot. And so that means every time the person puts the pen to paper, that's a yud. That's the beginning. And then every stroke of the pen is another letter. When you put it together like a house, it forms is another letter. And then the letters form another letter. That's not my point, but I got to explain a little bit of this to share with this with you. So then if you want to know what the anointing is, I'll share with this. How many of y'all should know Mem now? What, what does Mem represent? The kingdom or kingship. But let me, I'll make it easy for you. Write Mem, write access. Write revelation. Now, if you are not going to be fooled and corrupted, because remember this is the word. Let me write Christ. If I write Christ, y'all think anointing, okay? Anointed or anointing. So if this is the word Christ, this is the real word in Hebrew. So it is, if you are going to get the real Christ, it starts with the kingdom. The word starts with the kingdom. If you're going to get the real anointing, it starts from 
the kingdom. Access to the revelation. Mem is another, another word for that is water or flow or revelation or the ideas and concepts of God's mind. Y'all write that down? What does it start with? The kingdom. What does the anointing start with? So if he is the Christ, what would be his message? I don't know if y'all getting this. So why would Jesus, Christ, if he's not anointed, he don't start with this? Fake preachers never start with this because there's no anointing. Because the anointing reveals to him the kingdom. Fake preachers don't start where the anointing starts because they don't, un- first of all, they probably don't understand these things. But secondly, it begins, remember right to left, it begins with a revelation of the kingdom. Access, write it down, access to a hidden realm of kingdom understanding. It is the government of God. It is the mind of God. You get translated from kingdom of darkness and you get put into the kingdom of light. Oh, it gets better. This is totally different from the first amendment. I got you. Somebody say shin. Shin is, I'm, 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 I'm watering this down so everybody can get it. Shin is a couple of elements I want to share with you. Say fire. Say power. Shin is the Hebrew letter. It act, actually, I can't draw a shin, but it, it's got three almost like flames. It almost looks like a W with a, like a tail under it that connects it, but You can Google it later, but shin, fire, power, and grace. Let me explain grace to you. Grace is not permission to do what you want to do. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. So so what does the gospel start with? If you're going to be the Messiah and now you guys are also the representatives of God, anointed just like Jesus was, you're going to start with a revelation of the kingdom. Shin is fire, power, grace. This is a simple definition. Grace is a provider of certain things. Now write this down because you never heard it like this before. Grace allows you, it write down, tuned in. Start with that. Tuned in. Grace provides righteousness. Write that. I'm just going to put right because I'm running out of space. Grace allows you to see the kingdom. In other words, this all put together, it literally dumps the information onto you. And this is why. Because, and by, uh, this is also what it means. It means to assimilate. Grace assimilates you. Grace trains you. What happens with shin, it, and it influences you, right? Influence too. This is my favorite thing to do, y'all, is teach. Influence. Fire, power, grace, influence. In other words, what grace does, watch this, watch this. Y'all ready for this? Grace tunes you in, makes you righteous, as- trains you, and assimilates you to the understanding of who you are so that God has a compatible structure to flow the power through. If you are not exactly like God, the power won't flow. So he, since you can't be like God on your own, he makes you like him. I said grace is God making you like him, not just in theory, but literally like him so that the power and the influence of God can travel through you. He makes you the same as him. He makes your mind just like his. He makes your culture just like his. Now he makes it. You don't make it. He makes it. He makes the laws you believe the same as his. He makes your thoughts the same as his. Why would he do that? Not to take you to heaven. Grace ain't to get you to heaven. Grace is so the power of the kingdom can get to earth. He's trying to make a compatible vessel. But he can't flow through carnality. and He can't flow through them other beliefs. And he can't flow through that system. You got to believe what he believes. So he literally gives you the mind to do it. He gives you a kingdom and puts it inside of you so he can work through you. 
He don't make you righteous so he can brag to the angels. He makes you righteous so he can get through you. He can't flow through dirty stuff. He's got to have something clean and righteous that looks just like him. It's got to be like him. It can't be like him in theory, but in behavior it's not. It's got to be exactly like him. Once you have the mind of God and you have the investment of God and he has put himself inside of you. Somebody say, hey. Hey is the last piece. Hey, say hey, is expression. Do your hand like this, say hey. This is the same thing, the same idea in Hebrew. Hey. Hey. It's to get your attention. They have another expression. Ho. We do that too sometimes. You talk yelling for a cab or something. Ho. Ho. Hey. So when you put it together, I'm going to give you some more on that. So you got access to the revelation. God puts a compatible mind. He aligns everything that he has. He puts it on you. That's what kingdom takeover is. You see now why he can't use your stuff. Because it's not compatible. How is God going to supply every need according to his riches and glory? And you keep waiting on him to use the exact job and the exact things and the exact way and the exact. And God can't. He's got so much stuff for you that he can't move through that mindset. So he says, please think bigger. Please prepare bigger. I put a bigger vision in you. I put bigger things in you. I put me in you. I put my compatibilities and capabilities in you. Should I teach some of this at the conference this weekend? Because I promise you ain't none of them speakers going to do this to you. They can, I can't let them come in my house and not preach me now. I'm not going to let that happen. It's not a competition, but I'm keeping score. We're going to track amens. I'm just kidding. Dr. Trim, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to let Pastor Ron out preach me. I'm just kidding. He's probably watching this right now. Y'all getting it? Watch this now. Expression. This is how it has to happen. Because the kingdom eventually has to become public. The anointing is not to hide off in you. It is to... Look, if it don't go through these steps, it never makes it to the earth realm, the expression realm. So this is why, so in the kingdom, there is no pain, no sickness, no disease. Your understanding of yourself has to change because in God, he didn't give you any of those things. And then, therefore, the expression of what we are should be congruent with everything else. But it starts over here in the kingdom. The Messiah had to preach the kingdom. Any other gospel would make him not the Messiah. He can't preach works. He can't preach righteousness by works. He can't preach any other doctrine. He can't preach any other method. He can't preach any other salvation. Jesus didn't even preach Jesus. Because he knows people fake that word. He said, no, I came to preach Yes, he is the king, but what came out of his mouth was what was in his heart and in his mind. So the kingdom is in him. So what comes out over here has got to be a kingdom. On earth as it is in heaven. With grace in the middle, amen. All right, now watch this. I'm going to let you all out here. You're going to be so happy today. We're closing the message today. Next week, next Sunday is a new series, okay? Somebody say, hey. Hey is the element of preaching. Hey is the element, the final culmination on the earth of praise. When you preach without you got to put these things in order. If you preach on your own strength, no anointing. If you preach your own ideas, no anointing. If you preach your own understanding, no anointing. If you preach 
and you don't have the understanding and access. This is, remember, this is authority, power, clearance, revelation, and the flow, the water, the flow of heaven through that. If you don't do it from this point of view and this perspective and this level of consciousness, this level of government, no anointing. It is the anointing that destroys the yoke. And lifts the burden. So why do we preach the kingdom every single Sunday? Because I want it to be anointed. Because I want your life to transform. I want your expression and what you say and what you do over here. I want it to look like what's happening in heaven. Somebody say hey. Hey means to bring it into being to get someone's attention it means to take up the space it means to occupy a territory it means to manifest the fruit it is the child of the revelation of the kingdom and the child of grace you put the kingdom together with grace and they have an offspring and it says hey it is born out the correct way this over here is a birth realm these are incubating into a final birth. It must finally be a fruit. Hallelujah. So what happens when we, Jesus, go to um, Mark 1, 14. Are y'all still good? I, I got like, let me, give me like eight more minutes. I can try to get out of here. Are y'all seeing the anointing? Are y'all seeing Christ? Y'all ain't never seen this before. Christ, the anointing, the truth, is made up of these things. This is what God put in you. This is going to find its way into your behavior. It's got to birth a behavior. It's got to birth activity. It's got to birth words. Are your words filled with the kingdom and grace? Is your movements and your activities and where you go every day, the actions, is everything you're expressing in life, is it coming from this anointed place from within you? Is this guiding you? That's what should be your expression. You should live by that. You should Listen, grace also has wisdom and all of that in it. So you should be walking and birth. Every movement you make should be in support of this identity of Christ. If you're going to support your real identity, your movements, your words, your activities, your choices, your wisdom have to come from this dimension. You can't operate out of necessity and out of fear and out of what other people are doing modeling in front of you. You can't operate out of the desires of your belly. You have to operate out of the desires of the heart of God. Everything you do has to support that. Psychologists have a term for this. When you are, I'm a believer. Somebody say, I'm a believer. Say, I'm anointed. And we're so anointed, but we can't demonstrate the kingdom. There's a term for this in psychology. It's called cognitive dissonance. What is cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is the battle of ideas in your mind. And then which one? You have two opposite ideas in your mind. We have the carnal realm or the natural earth or natural systems or natural laws or natural medicines or natural this and natural ways out, and natural solutions and natural mindset and natural philosophy and all of these things. And we keep God out of it. You know what I'm saying? Like you want to meditate? You meditate. If you meditate without meditating here, that's demonic. You can't just meditate. I know folks want to steal God's stuff and then put it over here, but don't let him be included in it. So then you meditate on what? The Bible tells you what to meditate on. You don't just start making up stuff about yourself. Because the demons come into that realm and they start giving you a false Jesus. You think, you, I'm meditating on the Lord. You don't even know the Lord. You might be meditating on some false religious Jesus you heard of somewhere else. Somebody should get my book reprogramming because it talks about Jesus as a king. And fix your head about what he is and who he is. But anyway, so you got to understand something. When you are doing things in life, if you are not doing it, the belief you have has to match the behavior you have. The belief you have has to match the grace you have and the behavior you do. The belief you have has to match the grace you have and the behavior you do. 
You get what I'm saying? The belief you have. Oh, I believe in those laws of heaven. I believe in the kingdom. I believe in the government of heaven. I believe in super consciousness and the, and the supernatural. And I believe in what Jesus said he can do. I believe we can lay hands on the sick. and they, I believe in the supernatural supply of God. I believe in the power of faith. I believe. I believe. But you don't ever do. You know, I'm going to tell you why. Because here's what happens. Y'all have to give me a second here. The idea is that we develop identity around the stuff that we do. Okay? We develop this identity around stuff that we do and stuff that we believe. And when Jesus, did you put my scripture up? Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, and what did he preach? Jesus preached a different world, never used the material means to fix something. Never, he never, he never t- told a person, go to the hospital, or we're going to have to have surgery on that, or we're going to have to, he never did that. In fact, people say, well, didn't he put dirt on people's eyes? Don't you know, it's not, dirt is nothing until it's on the altar. It's not the sacrifice that sanctifies something, it's the altar that sanctifies the sacrifice. Dirt is nothing until it hits the sacrifice. Once the sacrifice, the sacrifice is nothing till it hits the altar. The altar sanctifies the sacrifice. Jesus made the dirt of medicine. It's not medicine. Jesus could have picked up anything. He could have been like, here, let's try this. Look. Because it's in him. And he knows that material minded people, they need a crutch. So he said, all right, I'm going to use this dirt. It ain't the dirt. It's me. Paul can anoint handkerchiefs and send them to people and get them healed because he knows they're carnally mine. You don't need that. They know that the anointing oil is an old system. You don't need oil, but sometimes we might use oil because it's easier for people's faith. You need no oil. I'm oil. You need no oil. We cook fish with oil. Some folks, if you don't use the oil, they're like, it ain't powerful. I, look, this word is oily. It is the altar that sanctifies the sacrifice. Not the sacrifice. It don't matter what he used. It ain't the plant. It's the one believing. It ain't the Tylenol. It's your faith in the Tylenol. When you get programmed into a carnal system, your mind by default works on the carnal system without you having to think about it. And since Tylenol is branded a pain reliever, that's why you get some pain relief. It's not because there's power in it. Your belief in it makes it powerful to you. That's also why, for me, I'm going to tell you the truth. Before I even knew Jesus, I don't know how I got to this mindset, maybe because we were poor and we didn't have stuff. But, you know, when you don't have stuff, you don't believe in it, right? So maybe because we couldn't go to the doctor and we didn't have medicine, pain relievers never helped me. I had no, I had no, every time I had my wisdom teeth pulled out and they gave me pain relievers and I said, well, let me try it. And I, it didn't do anything. I said, well, before I get hooked on pain relievers, I just gave, you know, I just threw them away. Because pain relievers never have an effect on me. They don't help me. And it's because I don't, somewhere in my mind, I don't believe in it. It's not that I, I mean, in my mind, I try to believe, and I say, wait, this will help. This will be quick, a little quick fix. But see, if we don't ever mature, what if you can't get to a Tylenol? What if you can't get to any help? What if people turn on you? What if you can't afford the treatment? What if you can't go to the doctor? What if? Where is your hope? Can I keep going? Some people are getting healed right here. I'm telling you the truth. And anyway, you take a tile off your foot hurts. It don't go to your foot. It goes to your head. It blocks carnal pain receptors in the head. It don't even go to the, pot, the spot of the pain. And it circulates through your whole body and it gives your whole body a toxin. The word of God goes directly to the spot needed and doesn't circulate and give you a side effect. I like punching the devil in the face. You know when you're getting people out now, if you're, listen, I'm not negating some of your beliefs and material needs. Listen, but I want you to start graduating. 
Because I'm showing you what the, anoint, the anointing destroys. There ain't no material stuff in here. You will produce, express, behave. Now watch this. If your belief system is not congruent with your activities, it puts you in a place of distress. If your belief system is God will do it, but you still continue to function in the old way. You still walk the same. You still talk the same. You still hang out with the same. What you're sending to your mind is an opposite signal. You said you believe what God had for you. You said you believe this is true. You said you believe that is true, but your behavior doesn't show that. And so now you got to clash. My behavior says one thing. My mind says another thing. And my, and my uh, belief says another thing. And I'm having a conflict in my mind. Psychologists call this cognitive dissonance. And what happens is your mind is so keen. Are y'all okay for a few more seconds here? Your mind is so in need of having order where things make sense. So Jesus comes and introduces the kingdom, which is a different system. Many people rejoiced and got healed. Many people got supplied. Many people learned it and repented. Many people came into the kingdom. Many people got saved. And some did not. Isn't that weird? He came to his own. His own didn't receive him. But those who did receive him, he gave him the rights to become children of God. Isn't that weird that Jesus Christ himself came, but not everybody wanted it? It's because he said, the people who don't want me, he said they love their darkness. In other words, their programming is set, and they don't want to change it. And when I say to you, you don't need that crutch anymore. When I say to you, you don't need that mat anymore. When I say to you, you don't need that, that relationship anymore. When I say to you, you don't need that job anymore. Don't quit your job. When I say to you, unless the Lord tell you, I mean, don't just go quit your job. What I'm saying to you, you can work the job, but you shouldn't be there as a dependent. You should be there as an influence. Because you can create and generate a different level of wealth just by believing this and expressing it over here. And I got so much to tell you guys about the kingdom, I just don't have time to fit it all in. Listen, listen. Remember last week I told you, I said something happened when I started tasting how the kingdom, I mean, when I, especially planting this church, I knew the power of God before, and I had it on a certain level. But when God took my job away for three plus years, and then I had to plant a church, had to pay all the bills, had to still survive, had to do all of that. Nobody had an income, and I started learning how the kingdom worked on a completely different level. You remember that? Now, once I started tasting that, here's the funny thing. Over time, the level got better. I went through a period of withdrawal from that old system because even though most people know, say, I believe in the kingdom, they live in both worlds. They said, well, sometimes I'm going to let God do that part and I'm going to do this part. And listen, this is why I, I know last week I was talking about people's hair, so y'all don't get mad at me. Actually, I wasn't talking about nobody's hair. Me and my wife was having a discussion here. Y'all was just here for that. And I was just telling y'all how our situation went. I know everybody went and got their hair done this week. <laughs> Ain't nobody looking at you or judging you, okay? I'm just telling you how we were suffering, okay? And so anyway, but when you start tasting a certain level of how to get things done, how this government functions, it makes you not be relatable to the way the world functions anymore. And you don't go to that firsthand anymore. And you don't stress anymore. And you don't worry anymore. You do business with your father. You go back to this realm here and you say, I know the law of supply. God's supply is not struggling. I know the law of healing. I know the law of blessing. I know the law of this. I know the law of that. I don't listen. My knowledge of God is being renewed to the point where I don't need that other system as much. And something happens the moment you taste that. Something happens the moment you taste that. And you start separating from people that don't have that same revelation. And now they will have you cutting coupons. And you know what bothers me? This bothers me. This only me, so not you, okay? It bothers me now. I, I'm not like, y'all, over here, I'm filthy rich, okay? I got it in me. I'm working on getting it over here. But I got a lot of it going. I'm, I mean, it's, it's moving like it. I mean, I get results, okay? Okay, but, but see, here's the thing. And it doesn't matter what type of style you like. It don't mean you have to live fancy. But what I'm saying is you should have the ability to do what God called you to do and not live on the bottom and not be struggling and begging. 
Anybody want to live like that? It's already there. It's already yours. It already belongs to you. But what's happening is, over here, you believe in God for everything, but you complain about the prices. Cognitive dissonance. Your brain says, I thought you had it. Wait a minute. You said you believe in abundance. Then you just said, Lord, help us, please, Lord. And you, now you short circuit it. Because out of your expression, you're saying something they never say over here. So that's not an anointed statement. Over here, you're saying, I have everything. I am everything. I'm everything God called me to be. You said, but my body feels something. You should just tell that's a lie. God don't have no pains to give you. Cognitive dissonance is, is like where you start, like, you know, you have a pain in your leg. And then you say, I guess I'm going to have to live with this. You know what I know the doctor said. What you're doing is supporting an old identity. You're giving it words. You're giving it attention. You're giving it affirmation. You're giving it confirmation. You're giving it money. Every, your mind is going, but you keep paying for it. But your mind says, you keep cutting coupons. You keep complaining about it. You keep looking at the discount paper. You keep doing So your spirit is saying, I am about to go to another level as soon as they put it on sale. All right, I'm tempted. This I'm not going to say anything else. Listen, no judgment on the level you are expressing right now and demonstrating. But what God wants for you, can I just say it that way? Don't be mad at me, please. But what God wants for you is you lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You go into the world and be a completely different system. You're going to be an offense to all of those who are dependent on that system. But what happens is every addict goes through a withdrawal. They're going to hate you, shun you, hiss at you, persecute you. But some of them, you will get them born again, saved, and they'll start walking in that same dominion. And we don't have time to support old identities. We ain't got time to walk like we're scared and walk like we're at risk and walk like we're vulnerable and walk like we're nervous. Did you know your body can read if you're sitting like you're nervous? As a person who before dealt with severe anxiety, I learned that even if you are slouching in your chair, the body thinks there's something wrong with you. Your countenance is a program from your subconscious. You have to sometimes say, rejoice, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Because in your spirit, yes, we know that you have the perfection of God, but does your soul know it? You can't support, you can't express that old identity. Even if you don't feel like it, walk like you're victorious. Even if you don't feel like praising, you can't say it's not my personality. God said, I didn't ask you if it was your personality. I said, give me a praise. I said, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Not like, hey, praise the Lord. When this turn around, then I'll shout. When this situation gets better, then I'll. I didn't ask you to wait for it to turn around. I said, if it's in your spirit, express what's in your spirit. Don't express what's in your way. Express what's in your spirit. You see why it's important? If you want the anointing to move, you express what's in the kingdom. You say what's in the kingdom. You act what's in the kingdom. You make plans on what's in the kingdom. You get a vision from God and you schedule it. Stop scheduling your every day the same. Well, I got to go to the doctor, then I got to go to this, and then I got to go to that, and I got to go to this. You have to start scheduling your activities different because your activities are still trying to witness to you that something is wrong when the grace of God and the kingdom of God is saying everything okay. You said, but when is it going to be okay? It's going to be okay when you get a congruency. When your spirit understands what God has given you and you just start walking like it is so. Talking like it is so. And yet people are going to say, but you ain't rich yet. Say, but I am rich. you just looking at the wrong thing right now. I got it. I just don't have it on me yet. You know, somebody asks you for money, you say, yes, I do, God. I just don't have it on me. Stand to your feet and let's give God some praise. Say, I, say, I got it. I just don't say, I got it in me. I got it in me. I want you to act, talk, and walk. I want you to ignore symptoms, signs, 
and circumstances because that is a short circuit to what God is trying to do. The anointing can flow. I don't care how your carnal mind picks up the senses. We forget all of that. We're going by what is true. What is revelation? What is the vision of God? How does the government of heaven work? I'm going to function by that government. I don't care what the symptoms say. I'm going to change these. Boy, I hope that helped y'all because it took me a lot to preach that. <laughs> and I know it's 104, but God was healing people earlier and that took up some of my time. And some of y'all just, listen. I don't, it's not about material things, but, but eventually your material things are going to change because it's an expression. Now, you can have whatever style you like. You don't have to put on designer this and that. But if it's whatever you like, that's what you wear. But when it comes to where you live, what you drive, where your kids go to school, you should not be thinking about lack. I want you to start talking, acting. You're going to be surprised how fast that little stuff can change. Talk to those things from this dimension, but with this type of grace in your heart. That word was for y'all. I didn't even preach that in the first one. Okay.